my son McKinnon. McKinnon, say hi to the angels. Hello. <laughs> um, this is going to be an interesting show because I might cry through it. <laughs> because it's very rare for somebody to interview their own child about depression. But one of the things that I thought would be good for us as a spiritual community was to understand how depression works, what happens inside someone that's been clinically depressed. McKinnon has been hospitalized for his depression. Um, how it affects the family, um, some of the thought processes that may um, be present in one's mind when they're thinking about uh, leaving the planet. Um, I'll give you just a little background, though, as part of McKenna's uh, karmic profile, because, you know, <clears throat> we talk about karmic profiles, we talk about fractal, we talk about patterns repeating, and this child was a uh, premature child, and um, he was given uh, 50, he was actually 6 pounds and 7 ounces. He, and I, we, we, I thought he was going to be on time. I had a scheduled C-section, but the doctor made a mistake. And I made a mistake on the date and everything. So he was actually about four weeks premature. And it was lucky because the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. And had he gotten any bigger, he would have been uh, stillborn. But because he was a preemie, he had undeveloped lungs, and lungs means grief, and so he was given a 50-50 chance uh, to live. So his spirit has never been quite sure <laughs> whether he wants to be on the planet. And he is uh, um, was born in 1979, so um, he uh, is going to have a birthday here coming up. And um, so we're going to talk tonight about depression and do the best we can to share with you how it affects me as his parent and him and, and some of his journey with depression. But before we get started, I have a couple of questions. And by the way, I want you all to call in. He said that he was willing to answer any question that he could. Um, and you'll understand if he can't answer it. Um, but if you have questions about depression and what it feels like or what the signs and signals are to look for or, or you know, we're going to talk about some of the things that, you know, people can do or say that will help or some of the things that don't help and that kind of thing. So please call 602 eight seven five zero four 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 and I'm gonna try to not cry through this but before we um, start I have a couple of questions one from Lucy and you know we've all talked about Lucy's mom before Lucy's mom has advanced Alzheimer's and <clears throat> she is saying that she's declining drastically down to 98 pounds bed sores shaking and how heartbreaking it is to see this and I too you know lost my mother that way by the time she left she couldn't speak she couldn't eat she was you know in a wheelchair with her hand kind of curled up and shaking she had dropped down in her weight um, and it was called failure to thrive and so you know I don't know Lucy if hospice has been called in um, but hospice should be called in with your mother at this stage even if she is in a nursing home or a nursing facility you still want hospice in because they take care of certain aspects of the palliative care um, over and above what the nursing home will do and um, she said that her mom has been declining for five years and why doesn't the spirit just let the body go you know Lucy I just wish I had the answer for this actually because it is a very very tough question um, I I honestly think that there is a consciousness factor that is part of how the spirit, the subconscious, and the conscious work together. And people with Alzheimer's don't always know enough to go, for one thing. Um, they don't have a level of awareness. Now, you might say to me, well, doesn't the spirit always have a level of awareness? Well, yes, the spirit has a level of awareness, but there must be something within your mother's karmic profile or in partnership with yours or the loved ones around her that are keeping her here on the planet. I know that my sister actually was um, very upset about my mother's passing and my sister it took her a long time to kind of let her go so I will say to you that it, it could be part of your journey to understand patience or to um, you know um, 
be able to let go. It could be her journey. It could be a combination. But I, I just really don't have a firm answer on that. I'm sorry. Other than to say that I know all of the angels and we'll all pray that your mother actually leaves because I think, you know, it's uh, terrible for you to see her that way, and we're going to pray that she leaves. Um, you might want to just uh, let us know her uh, name for next week, and we'll all hold her in our prayers. <clears throat> and then I have a question from Joyce about the aura. What does it mean when you turn around and look at someone you know, and the aura around them is one that is almost shocking to where you cannot look at them? Hmm. Well, that could be two things, two ways, two ways. So someone, and, you have, and she says you have to immediately turn away. Somebody can have a bright, brilliant, beautiful aura. I know we went to church a couple of weeks ago at a church that isn't our normal church to go to. And the priest there had such a beautiful aura that I cried through the entire mass because his aura was just magnificent. So you can see an aura that's bright and beautiful and have to turn away from that aura because of the magnificence of it. Or you can look at somebody's aura that may be dark or brooding and have energy around it that makes you feel like something's wrong and you have to turn away. So, you know, it, it, it just depends. And, you know, auras change in reference to some of the activity in our lives and and what we're doing and where we're at so you know we're talking about depression so you know sometimes somebody with a depression has different colors in their aura you know one of the colors that McKinnon has in his aura is green and the reason for that is because green is a healing color and um, you know McKinnon has been out of work for how long son Six months. Six months because of his depression. And I think he'll tell you that one of his lucky things is that he's had a lot of family support and that we've been able to keep him still in his own home and, you know, keeping him so he's not um, behind on bills. I mean, it's he's not... Um, rolling in the dough. <laughs> he's to, he's it's still hand to mouth because obviously there's you know issues around some of that. But um, he's been out of work for um, six months. But I, he just got a new job, so he's on the upswing. So his aura would have a lot of green. If you look at his heart chakra here, you'll see a lot of green. Um, but a lot of times, McKenna's aura will have a lot of. Um, you know, tchotchke energy around it because that's where his mind goes is to some tchotchke stuff like as far as, you know what I mean by tchotchke? Mm -mm. Um, you know, ruminating about things or not being able to sleep, you know, that okay. kind of stuff that, that happens with depression. Right. So one of the, the things, stuff. the depressive stuff, one of the things though, before we start talking about the depression that I must share with you is, I don't know if you all are familiar with my book here, if you could see inside of me. This is a book that my son and I collaborated on together. It's a book about bullying. Everything is done in rap song. And um, so... It's a it's a really uh, kind of uh, fun book, um, uh, you know. Um, so here's one: Daddy lost his job. I'd like to be a superhero so I can fix my dad. He lost his job and doesn't work and makes my mom so mad. We have to live inside our car and don't know when we'll eat. My clothes are dirty and too small. My shoes don't fit my feet. I dream of having a house and a yard and being warm and dry. I dream of having our own room so my sister doesn't cry. My mom says I have to be the man because my daddy went away to find some work and a house and he'll be back someday. I know she's just saying that for all of us to stay strong, but as far as him coming back, I think she's just plain wrong. Um, I go to school afraid you'll know where we live and why. That's why I keep to myself, and that's why I look so shy. So that's just one of the, oh, it's, there it goes on here. If you find out what's happening, it would be real bad. I'd have to leave my mother. She's all I've ever had. So I'll keep pretending things are not this way. Mom says keep on praying, but I don't like to pray. That way I'll get on going with the things the way they are, and God won't let me down again while I'm living in my car. So that's the wrap that I wrote, and this is this magnificent. Can you see it? Yeah? Can you see it? This is the magnificent, um, beautiful uh, drawing that my son did, and he did one for each each one of the wraps. And so we uh, there's one with the the uh, cheerleading girl, and so um, we collaborated on this what two years, two years ago, ago, three years ago, and so that was a good thing that we kind of a fun project that we did with with each other, yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
So, McKinnon, not only have you um, suffered from depression, but you also have been a suicide survivor. Yeah. Because you've lost a great, you know, I you're, lost a few. Yeah, your your generation is called the Indigo Generation. You know, the Indigenous Generation tattoos, gauges, you know, piercings, that kind of thing. And in your in your generation, there's been a lot of drugs. There's been a lot of depression. And so, do you? Um, know how many of your friends have left the planet through their own Close devices? Friends? Mm -hmm. Almost ten. Almost ten. Like and nine. I think I'm on nine now. Yeah. My friend CJ just um, lost her battle with depression uh, about a month and a half, maybe two months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that so, was a surprise because she was one of those really th what I thought was thriving. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you don't see the depression. Mm. So how do you uh, um, how do you find uh, a way to uh, help somebody when you don't see it? That's kind of like you, if somebody's covering up that you don't know. There's nothing you can do. There isn't. You have to wait for them to come to you. So do you think that you have been suffering for from depression for? A greater part of your life because from my perspective as your mother and I, I hope you all appreciate the emotional courage that this takes for both of us and I'm going to get to the phone calls in just a second but uh, you know from my perspective as your parent I felt like your depression started in your late 20s for the last 10 or 12 years yeah, I, I felt like mid. through your 20s that everything seemed to be I think it was like 27 mm-hmm once I lost, it was it was a control thing. I lost control of my emotions because I was always was able to keep them in check before. So, is there a, a, a control issue with being depressed? Then you think that depression? It's a spiral thing. You're out of control, and you spiral out of control, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And sometimes you just can't claw back up because mm -hmm. it's a fight. It's like being stuck in quicksand, mm -hmm. and you got to try to reach that, go out and reach that stick to pull yourself out, and you sometimes just can't reach, and you, sometimes you just sink, and that's all there is to it. So, was there one pivotal moment in your life where the depression came? You know, when psycho Morgan died. When Morgan died. So, yeah. so Morgan was a good friend. Yeah. And somebody that you had romantic feelings for. Yeah. And she had lost the father of her child through suicide right and she left behind a, a note for you yes and so you felt like that's when the the spiraling out of control happened yeah that was that was a rough day when and it, her mother is the one that called me and I was at work I worked at the University of Phoenix at at the time and her mother called me and I didn't know who it was. I said hello. And she goes, McKinnon, honey. This is you know, this is Patsy. Morgan's mom. And I'm like, Okay. How are you? You know, like, what are you calling me for? This is weird. And, <clears throat> and she goes, Morgan died, honey. And I just And just hit the floor. Right in front of all my coworkers. I know that was a hard thing. Let's get a phone call, okay? You want to transfer the first caller in? Jane. Jane. <clears throat> Hi, Jane. How are you tonight? Hi. Oh, I'm fabulous. Oh my gosh. I just must say, your son is amazing. Thank you. It takes and it takes a lot of emotional courage to tell people about your journey with depression and start out with the, the original trauma. I'm really proud of him for that. So far, so far, so far. Yeah. <laughs> you. He was born the same year my son is. Ah, very nice. Yep, good year to be born. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good born exactly. It's a good year to be um, pregnant. Gas prices yeah. were on high. 
think every year is a good year to be pregnant. I would, well, <laughs> I don't know about that, Jane, but um, do you have a question for McKinnon tonight? I do, and it's probably going to be covered. You kind of answered one already, uh, like how did you know when did it start? But so if now you are aware of it, what type of things do you do to keep from spiraling down or maybe not spiraling down, but spiraling down to where it's unrecoverable, so keeping well, yourself, you know, in a positive state? That's the rub, is it's constant. It's a constant battle. Um, I'm on medication. I go to therapy. Um, you know, you have to talk about these things. You have to get them out or else they're just going to eat you up. And so, <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. And so what I, I do is I have to realize when I start having those feelings where I can't handle it anymore or I just want to sleep all day, you have to understand and, and I have to understand and let, let myself know that it's all part of a chemical imbalance. It's not real. The feelings that I have are not real. The, the feelings of everyone hates me and no one cares about me and things like that. I have to recognize that they're not real. And, and it's like having Alzheimer's almost because two days later I could be going down that same road and have to stop and start again and say it's not real. And um, with the help of doctors and support from your family and friends, you're able to start making breakthroughs and get back to your normal self after a while. And the, the suicidal ideation and the depressive status starts being a little bit more intermittent. And the longer time passes between having those feelings and then they get even longer and even longer and eventually you're, break, you're breaking through, you know, you're happier more times than you're not. And that's where I'm at now is I'm trying to break free of that where I have a suicidal ideation one day and I have to not let it get to me and I have to push it away and continue on and, and it's slowly it's been getting a larger portion of time between my next time I have a suicidal ideation and they're gonna come everything's gonna keep coming but with all the help that you can get these days you're able to get past it and that's what I'm doing now so, they were, happy. we're happy for that thank you yep. so then two more questions um, one um, so how did you first recognize it or did somebody recognize it for you and you accepted help or did you feel that oh I can just get over this myself did you really recognize it and also do you like really think in your head are you just like real is your head your mind going all the time yeah my mind's going all the time that's for sure it's that's one of the major problems with depression is that it won't stop it just doesn't stop and and it's relentless and you have to try yeah, to see I'm past it. That. You have to try to see past it. It's relentless. It doesn't stop. And even with medication, my head still goes a mile a minute. But to answer your the first part of your question, when did I first know and did I try to fix it myself? Yeah, definitely. I After Morgan died, I lost something that meant more to me than me. That was the first time I ever had that. <clears throat> and so I didn't know where I was. I lost track of my emotions. I wasn't able to control them anymore. And that was new to me as well, and that scared me. And so, yeah, I was scared because I knew I was depressed. I knew I didn't have control of my emotions. But I also didn't want to let anybody else know because that was weakness. And I was never a weak person. So I, <clears throat> I want to step in here for just a minute and explain to you 
um, that for most of my children's lives, I, I was a single, intermittently a single mother. And uh, McKinnon was my, 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 my middle, is my middle child and, and was my star child. So not that my other two kids aren't stars. That's not what I mean. But when they were children, um, McKinnon was the one that I taught to drive when he was 13 years old because if I was alone and something happened to me, I trusted that at 13 he'd have the capability of getting me where we needed to be because I lived out in the country. He was the one that was uh, winning all kinds of accolades and awards for wrestling in school. He was the little league star. He was the one that if we, we had, ch had to change schools because um, of my older uh boy which hopefully someday he'll come in and talk about his journey with being gay and um, there was bullying being done so I had to move the kids to another school and he was the one that went, walked right into the first school dance the first Friday night that he was there without any issues or fear so he was always my star kid well, he was always a little bit OCD though I must say, you know, um, he, you know, he breezed through school. He was in um, in New York where I raised the kids. They had revolving door gifted programs, so he was in many gifted classes. And he he breezed through school, but he was the kid that his room was as neat as a pen always. He'd move his furniture around always, and so there was always some differences uh, between him and a, a teenager and so on. When he was a, a teenager, um, he was the kid that, you know, the the other kids hung out at our house and, and he and his friends, you know, all chipped in one Christmas Eve and got me a pinky diamond ring, you know, because they loved hanging out at the house. Like he was the star kid. He's still a star, but I'm just saying he was that kid. You know what I mean? He was that kid. And so yeah. that's why he's saying that his emotions were in check. He knew who he was. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. He got a job right out of high school that he raised to the top in the way in which until the company closed down, he had no need to go do anything else. So then he had to get his degree afterwards. And so there's just some things there that were a little bit of a different process in his life. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. So thank you for your call tonight, Jane. We appreciate the, the questions. Okay. Thank you. And McKinnon, thank you so much. That You're welcome. Very awesome of you. All righty. Good night. Night. You know, all of my kids have been taught about being um, emotionally courageous, right? And um, Debbie's on the line, and, and I, I believe Debbie did lose her son to depression. So I'm not 100% sure about that, but let's transfer her over, and, and can you talk to Debbie, son? Yeah. Hi, Deb. Hi, Melinda. How are you? Good. I, I'm not quite sure whether you lost your son to depression or to drugs or what. How did you lose your son, Deb? Are you there, honey? Did we lose her? Debbie? We lost her, Bill. Debbie? Yeah. We lost her. Okay, Debbie, call back because I don't know how or how we lost you, but I, I, I know McKinnon wants to talk to you. So um, I will tell you that um, I did not totally – I knew that McKinnon was struggling, and I knew – um, that he had some depression and I know that McKinnon has had huge hits in his life because some of his close friends that have gone to the other side I know I know who they are I've known them so but it wasn't until uh, last year when he ended up in the hospital for depression um, that I knew that it was at this level and I do think sometimes parents go into denial we'll talk about that after we do get Debbie transferred over <clears throat> Dad? Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry. I don't know how we lost you, honey. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. I was asking you um, so how, how Sean passed away. Um, they said it was an accidental overdose from prescribed meds, but there weren't enough in his system, so I really wasn't sure about that. I but see. I know in a reading you said it had something to do with his chest, and that was also on the autopsy. So. Ah, okay. So, was he? Did he suffer from depression? 
Yes, he did. Okay. And as a mom, it's so hard. And McKenna, I am so proud of you for doing this. You have no idea. Nice. I'm also somebody who suffers from depression. And I always felt bad, like I gave it to my son, like I was contagious. And that was something I dealt with. But it was before I lost him. But when I lost him, that's what started my spiral. And I can't tell you, like, how good it is to see somebody succeeding, even though he's not where he wants to be yet. He's still going. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, um, I must tell you, and I'm sure that he doesn't know this, Deb, but as his parent <clears throat> and as a spiritual person and understanding there was life after life, uh, when my son was in the hospital and I prayed and I communed with his spirit, and I said to his spirit, don't stay for me. If you can't take it here and you need to go, then you go. Stay for you. And because I want him to be here for him, I don't want him to be suffering on this planet you know that I'm encouraging at all for him to leave the planet I'm just saying I love and honor him enough that I don't want him to suffer in any way so it was the hardest prayer that I ever prayed in my life because it was a prayer of surrender and one of the things that I teach as all of you know is about the surrender that there are certain things that all we can do is pray about or move into our spirit or our higher power or our ability to accept or whatever and so it was it it, it, it was the the hardest hardest prayer that I ever ever prayed but I wanted to honor his spirit the other thing that I didn't do is I didn't um, my daughter did. I'll talk to you about my daughter in just a second. But I didn't go to his doctor's office with him because I wanted to give him the opportunity, the ability to work it out on his own. He's a man. And I, you know, you, you don't want to enable somebody to the degree where you're disempowering them. You don't want to take somebody's power away. And even with depression, you should have respect. You should have somebody that honors you. You should have somebody that respects that and trusts that you have some ability to, to make movement. And I, I wanted to respect and honor and empower him and step back a little bit and give him some room. But we all felt like his, his medication was making me a zombie making him a zombie and you know my daughter had stepped in once and gone to the doctor with him because my daughter is a social worker my you know my other two children are both in the in the in the social working industry but um and she knows a lot about meds so she had gone to the doctor once but then you know it felt like i needed to step in and tell the doctor that we were all concerned and we have a good psychiatrist we have a very good psychiatrist who listened to us and i think that's something important for everybody to know mm -hmm. that you got to have a doctor that listens and you got to have a family that don't can just go if if you go to a doctor and you don't feel comfortable don't stay right right and this guy really has gone above and beyond yeah, right yeah he's a good guy <clears throat> yeah he's a really good guy we like him and we were lucky we lucked out on him cuz you know cuz you know all psychiatrists are a little twitchy but <laughs> 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 but uh <clears throat> so he listened and he's and he's been working hard and trying to find the right you know, level combination. of combination for McKinnon to be more himself and still work, combat some of the, the uh, you know, the, the, uh, pardon? Chemical imbalance. Chemical, yes. <laughs> you put words in my mouth, Billy. <laughs> Billy's putting his two cents in, you guys. Uh, anyway, um, so um, that's really important to find a good doctor. And then going back to the family, I think McKinnon will agree that we stick together as a family through thick and thin. And it was um, to his sister and brother-in-law he went when he f he went to their house when he felt like he could no longer cope. And they, the three of them, sat down and talked about it. And they chose for him to go into the hospital for the depression. And my daughter waited until the end of my day because she knows that I help lots of people that would have set me off and be unable to do that and called me and let me know that he was in the hospital and when you go into the hospital oftentimes they don't have a bed so McKinnon was in 
a holding ward for how long? Three days. Three days. And next to him was somebody that was extremely mentally ill. He thought he was Satan. He thought he was Satan. So McKinnon had some very interesting conversations while he was waiting for bed. <laughs> <laughs> and actually did keep a sense of humor about that. You did laugh about that. Yeah, well, that was funny. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> so I was unable to see him in, I was not able to see him in the holding um, pattern. Um, my daughter said, you can't even call him. You can't do anything. But I did anyway. <laughs> and um, then they put him on a ward, and he was in for? Uh, almost two weeks. Yeah, almost two weeks. And um, McKinnon also is a diabetic, a type 1 diabetic, and um, he um, struggles with diabetes. What is a special type of 1, type 1, right? Yeah, we call it type 2. Yeah, but it's the same thing as that um, quarterback had. It's adult onset juvenile diabetes. Um, adult onset of juvenile diabetes, meaning that it's like juvenile diabetes, but it happens as an adult. So it's not quite a type 2. Not quite a type 1. Not we don't know what it is, actually. But it's neither diabetes. And neither does the doctor. And that contributes to some of the issues because he'd been in and out of the hospital with some diabetic issues for physical stuff before this, too. And that also has contributed. So he's got this whole profile of energy that he's combating in this lifetime. So um, what you want to ask Deb a question? Deb, he wants to talk to you. I was... I've seen it. We've, yes. been, we've been waiting on you, actually. We've been talking, and I was just, I felt bad. You haven't asked your question yet. Oh, he's telling me to shut up, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way he runs the show. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a Le he's a Leo, Deb. He's a Leo. He's a Leo, okay? Bad excitement. What's your question, Deb? Really? No, I lost two friends to suicide, and yet at the same time, I know because I was there, because I attempted, because I've been hospitalized, but yet I'm the person that will put on the smile and not let anybody know when something's bothering me. So that's a really tough road when you're trying to see it in another person or to recognize it in another person, because you don't want to approach them, because I know I wouldn't have wanted to be approached. But at the same time, if it's your child, you do what you can for them. And at the same time, you give them their space to work through their stuff. And I just, I guess I just hope that people understand that it's, it is definitely a chemical imbalance. But if you don't have the right doctor, it can go downhill so fast. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the right. You know, at the same time, like you said, if you don't feel comfortable, find another doctor. It's exactly. So important. And therapist. It's not just about a doctor. Yeah, it's you got to talk, you gotta talk right. about this stuff. And luckily, I have so many good friends that I'm, that understand where I'm coming from, that I'm able to talk to them, as well as finding a new therapist. But uh, if if they see that I'm down, like if they see a Facebook post or something like that, I get a phone call from at least two of them. So I'm okay. very lucky that I get, and and even if I don't want to talk to them, even if I say, "What do you want?" when they when they call me, you yeah. know, at least I I know that they're coming from a good place. And I think right. that so you have a good support system, which is really important. And I think that goes both ways. You know, knowing how I am, if I see someone that poor, that says something that's, you know, self-deprecating or something like that, I reach out to them, say, "Hey, what's up?" I don't have to go, "Hey, are you feeling depressed?" or, you know, push that button because that button doesn't necessarily need to be pushed. Sometimes all they want is someone to notice them. Right. So and was there ever a time when you hid your feelings? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, there was lots of times where I hid my feelings. You know, I tried to put on the happy face. For years I put on the happy face, and then it happened again. Then I had another friend pass away, and it was just, it was too much for me to bear. And that's right. when I, that's okay, when that's, I really that's, started. That's how, yeah, pretty much how it feels. It just kind of gangs up on you, and you spiral, and you just, you want help, but you want to be left alone, and you don't. You want to make it, but you just don't care. You're at the point of not caring. And that's, that's what a very happened. Scary place to be. That's what happened is I started not caring how I looked to other people anymore, and people started to notice. Yeah, I'm just I'm just so glad you're doing this. It's really important. Thanks. And I wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, Deb. We appreciate you your call too, and we want you to 
stay on your positive track and doing all that you're doing for yourself and honoring yourself and and moving through it too. We're 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 holding space for you as well. Thank you so much. So anyway, you have a good evening, Deb, okay? You too, thank you. Yep, bye bye. Bye. Well, Deb's from upstate New York. What part? Um, I think she, well, I know Ithaca came up a couple times. Um, Ithaca, Rochester, so I think she, Syracuse. yeah, maybe from Rochester, and that she had some uh, surgery down in Ithaca. So we're all from that same part of the world. So I was actually talking sorry. to Izzy today about moving to Ithaca because Cornell is there and it'd be a cool place to live. Yeah, Cornell is a, is a cool place. So, McKinnon, what do you think that people who are depressed need like you were just talking about when someone sees that there's a post or something that's negative or self-deprecating that um, you, you maybe just need a friend to reach out and say hey how you how you doing yeah I'm you know it's it's always going to be up to you whether or not you want to make that step of letting someone know that you feel depressed because it's embarrassing and Maybe they don't feel comfortable talking to you about it, but at least they know that there's someone out there that's reaching out, that's talking to them. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know that I struggle for the longest time. I was very emotional on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I would put something on Facebook that was just, you know, I hate myself type stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely a cry for help. I mean, you don't put stuff out there just to put stuff out there on the, uh, Facebook. If you didn't care, you wouldn't do that. Right. And so when the few that did reach out did, it made me feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. And How does anger play into it all? And you'd get angry sometimes because you'd put a post. I'd put a post on Facebook aiming for a certain specific person to see, and they wouldn't see it, or they did and they didn't respond. And that was how my head started thinking: was like, those a holes. Why are they not paying attention to me? And I would get angry, and then I would be very spiteful. Um, I would put spiteful things on Facebook. Uh, <clears throat> little angry quotes or something like that and if I ran into someone that I knew that I, I I wasn't very nice and people noticed so there was a stage of your life where there was a lot of anger and you were kind of like a porcupine yeah I guess that's a good way to yeah because I remember that stage <laughs> and it was hard you know on everybody because it's like that you have somebody different than you once had like your, your the personality changes now what what I'm seeing is his personality going back to where he was before so with this kind of trauma because you're you're gonna be um, you gonna be thirty seven? Thirty eight. You're gonna be thirty eight. Oh my gosh, I'm getting old. When did you catch up to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um That's Jason. <laughs> Jason's caught up to me a long time ago. Um when um um, now I lost my my oh when when you have a trauma I lost my train of thought then it came back to me um, and you were worried about me having Alzheimer's <laughs> that, that uh, when um, you have a trauma like that where you know you've had one after another uh, oftentimes a trauma will kind of stop stunt your growth when you mean one after another first the loss of one person so one, loss one after, after another right and, and you know that's what you've had is one loss after another like. Many, many, many. Like uh, you know, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I get phone calls from you that this one or that one or you know. Um, I went to a sur survival uh, suicide survivors meeting, mm -hmm. and one of the things that you had to do was they went around the table and they would say who they lost, mm -hmm. and everyone had the one person they lost, and then they had one person had two people that they lost. And then my friend, who I went with because I was there to support her because her brother had just committed suicide. 
you know, she said her brother, and then she looked at me, and she had all her tears in her eyes, and I said, so and so, so and so, so and so, so and so. I went down my list, and I got to almost, like I said, almost ten, eight or nine, and I just looked around the room, and everyone's mouth had dropped open, and the psychiatrist who was running the group, you know, was like. Wow, I very rarely run into someone who has come across that many suicides in their lifetime. And my poor friend Kelly <laughs> was crying her eyes out because <laughs> of everything. I felt so bad for her. Um, so I have had loss more than your another. fair share. So the trauma involved, and first of all, speaking of psychiatrists and support, I, I do want to mention that our psychiatrist couldn't get a hold of him on a couple of phone calls and he called me that's a good psychiatrist right he called me and said I can't get a hold of your son and we were away he's got my knife he, we were oh we were away and um, and so I immediately called my daughter because she was here in town but McKenna picked up the phone when I when I called him but my I psychological the number psych <laughs> psychologically speaking trauma stunts growth. So do you feel like you have an immaturity factor? Yeah, I feel it. Okay. That I need to catch up sometimes. Yeah. I feel like I'm still stuck in my 20s. Yeah. So you're going to be doing some some um, EMDR. Eventually, yeah. Yeah, which is about clearing trauma because one of the things that when we did meet with his doctor, that McKenna and the doctor and I agreed was that he needed to um, really work through the trauma. And e EMDR is a form of rapid eye movement that works through the brain frequencies and allows the brain to release trauma. Similar to what I do as a hypnotherapist when I'm working with childhood regression and, and, and trauma release. Um, McKinnon would be a perfect candidate for the kind of work I do, actually. Um, but of course, uh, you can't do therapy with your own child and this borders a little bit on weird when I'm having an interview with him too but you know we're trying to do this together collaborate together like we did on the book you know so um, but you know if, if if he went to someone that had the expertise in ch in childhood trauma as a hypnotherapist which I suggested there's somebody in, in North Scottsdale but he found through his friend a therapist that does EMDR and it, it's equally as powerful in, in its release. So he'll be doing some of that trauma clearing um, as he as he proceeds. One of the things that I think has been an inhibiting factor for McKinnon is that he hasn't wanted to um, do things because it costs more money and he's trying to be conservative about getting support from me and Billy as far as financial support. And I think that puts a, an, another burden on him, and I do understand that. And it is a, a sticky situation, so it does make it hard to find that balance so that he can do all that he needs to do for himself. Right, son? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So um, when you tell us what it was like for you to be in the hospital, like what did you get out of the hospital experience? The hospital was scary at first. Because the way they, they didn't place you based on what you were in for. You know, they just had a bunch of random people that had many different problems. You had people that <clears throat> thought they were Satan. <laughs> and people that were there because of addiction issues. You had people like me who were there for depression that were completely sane but suffered from depression. And having to mix that all up in the same area was scary. I actually made some friends there um, that I still talk to. And they're able to help because they understand how things work. So if I start feeling a certain way and be like, hey, Dave, how's it going? And he knows immediately, he's like, oh, hey, you know, how are you? Mm -hmm. Feeling okay? So it's a, a hospital for SMI, severely mentally ill. And they, you know, this is one of the reasons why I've asked McKenna to, to share, you know, some experience with us because we all need to kind of pull together and figure out a different way to handle um, 
mental illness, depression, you know, all of that stuff because you're lumping everybody into a category. And, and I would go visit McKinnon and McKinnon and I would be sitting in this area where you could visit and there would be people, you know, up and down the hallway talking to themselves and one in particular had to have an orderly walk with him the whole time. And so you're in this whole situation of uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. If if any of you remember that movie with Jack Nicholson, it is like that. It's like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And you're sitting there. I was sitting there with my child who was trying to stay on the planet with all this stuff around him thinking, how does somebody get better from this? You know, and luckily he did have some decent people that he associated with, and there were group there group therapy. The and afterwards, he did um, a um, outpatient intensive therapy, mm -hmm. um, which means that you go back to the hospital and was it? You don't go back to the hospital. They have specific it? rooms set up in different in different centers, IOP centers. Oh, I thought it was an IOP center in the hospital. I didn't nope. know that. No, nope. it just was a, like a meeting place. You know, they had like a bunch of meeting rooms and offices where the behavioral health staff worked. And that's it. So it was aftercare stuff. And yeah, I it was think aftercare, stuff. aftercare is really, really important. That helped way more than the hospital did, the aftercare. Yeah. Once they got me in the right group. I think the hospital is about trying to find meds that work. That's what the hospital is. It's probably, it, all it is is regulating your meds so you're not feeling as crazy as you were. Mm -hmm. Is it crazy that you were feeling? Yeah, I was feeling crazy. Mm -hmm. okay. Feeling really dark. So, you know, again, McKinnon feels, McKinnon and his sister are Irish twins, so they're very close in age, mm -hmm. and he feels very connected to her. So he, she was... Her, his safe person, I would say, yeah. Well, she knew, she had the expertise to know what I was going through. And my daughter met her husband from my son. My daughter's husband was friends with McKinnon and came over and hung out at our house. And that's how my daughter met her husband. They've been married for 11 years now and they've been together for 15. So they all know each other really, you know, tightly. So it was uh, the place where he, he went. Um, so what? No, it's also where I could take Nika. Oh, his dog. Yes, it's where he could take his dog. Um, so with that level of trauma and the emotional immaturity, what is the plan, the goal, the idea, the focus on getting back on track with that? Like, do you like do you strategize with your psychiatrist? Do psychiatrists strategize? Do you? Psychiatrist, he tried. I mean, he he wasn't sure I was ready to work when I told him I wanted to go back to work. He wasn't sure that was a good idea. He was like, it could go either way. And then when I started working here, he saw that it helped my patterns, and he thought it was a great idea for me to go back to work. And so we'll see when I go back in June to a full-time job if I can actually do it without falling into those patterns that I had before. Between the meds and seeing a therapist and the level of family support that you feel like you've gotten, are, do you think that that is less of a possibility because you've got everything aligned yeah, for you? I think it's better than, you know, when I was working at the company that I was working to last time, I couldn't, I couldn't even focus. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, are you okay every so day? So what we did, you know, what I did as a parent, and I, I say we because, you know, Bill has been instrumental in helping me figure out the right direction as a parent and how to do this so that, again, that I wasn't enabling and I was empowering and I wasn't, you know, it's a fine line that you walk as a parent, I think. And so for the first couple months that he was off from work, that was fine. But then as things progressed, we felt like he should come in here and work. And we actually just give him busy work. At t you know, it's important to me. It gets done. You know, I, it's, it's great that he does it because we'd have to figure out how to get it done. But we actually said to him, you got to be here at 9 in the morning and you can work half day and get yourself used to a working guy, acclimated and safety and that kind of thing. And he has never missed a 9 a.m. He is here at 9 every day just as if 
it was, you know, real I employment. I mean, it's real employment, but you know what I mean, just as if, you know, um, and so um, he, he honored what we asked of him. He's been here every day. He's doing that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, we, we, we think that we kind of initiated a plan that was helpful to getting back on track, getting back into the world, getting back into dealing with people again. And That's the hardest thing is dealing with people. Because sometimes you just don't want to put up with anything. You got too much on your own plate, and you just don't want to even talk to them. I understand that. Make sure that you're calling six zero two eight seven five zero four 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 if you have a question for us. You know, it's interesting. I did a wedding a couple weekends ago. You know that, and my friend said to me, "I I just don't understand why I'm so upset with people lately, and I just feel so annoyed. And there's got to be something wrong with me, and I need counseling. What could it be? And I leaned into her and I said, "Intelligence." <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, so uh, it's you know, tongue in cheek, but sometimes it is a tough thing when you have a lot of um, things that you've been through, and other people don't have any clue, and how that feels that you can get annoyed. Does that make sense? Totally makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Now. You just lack patience after a while. Lack pa Well, and you know, I mean, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, and I have, you know, gladly told anybody that I have the patience of a gnat, so, and Billy says I exaggerate, so. I do want you to know that we do have depression that runs in our family, um, that, you know, McKenna's karmic profile. I have uh, sisters um, that have uh, been in serious depression, two of them. Um, I have... Um, one been bipolar. Yes. One of my sisters was diagnosed bipolar. Um, on McKinnon's other side of the family, his paternal grandfather died at 52 years old from alcoholism. So, you know, alcohol is a depressant. And he was a lovely man. McKinnon doesn't remember him at all. But he was a lovely man. I loved him. Um, but he was couldn't hold down a job, and he was a terrible alcoholic. So um, on that side of the family, there's some issues. My grandma's dad, great-grandpa. Right. Alcoholic. My mother's uh, grandfather was a falling-down alcoholic. So I, you know, have cousins that have had some depression and addiction. I actually have second cousins. Interestingly, there is about 25 cousins and because remember, we're an Irish Catholic family, so my mother was one of six, and everybody had four or five kids, so that adds up to 25 real quick. And um, <clears throat> none of us had diabetes, but my second cousins, some of my cousins' children have diabetes also. And so it runs somewhere, but we don't, you know, it runs somewhere. Grandma got diabetes at the end, too. But it's elderly, you know, onset of diabetes, diabetes is, yeah, is, is much different than you getting diagnosed at 20. Three, Four. Okay, yeah. I was close. So you know that's 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 much different. So <clears throat> you're the go-to guy. Like for example, when we talk about your friend Jake, can you do you feel like you can talk about Jake for a minute? I'll probably cry, but that's okay. That's okay. I might cry too. Okay. What's that? Nothing. A new voicemail. Did you miss a call? No, that was, be a oh, okay. So Jake is McKinnon's friend that passed away at Christmas time. Well, four years ago. I think it's five, five Mick. Five years and ago. I think it was uh, December twenty third. Third. Okay. And Jake was a, maybe twenty second. Twenty second or twenty third. I, you know, we're like right Christmas. We're right there on it. You know, um, Jake. <laughs> Jake, Jake was is a awesome. hilarious. <laughs> There is a picture of Jake. First of all, Jake had a big bushy beard and big hair and... Um, he was a piercer, so he had tattoos from head to toe, big piercings in his lips and everything like that. He was, he was quite a sight to see when you saw him. And he was a giant teddy bear, and he looked scary oh, he as hell. He's he was a, a big, big guy. He looked like a giant Six, teddy bear. Right, he's six three, about three hundred pounds. And 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 at his uh, celebration of life, there was a picture of him that he put on a diaper, without any <laughs> clothes on. Like he was baby Huey. <laughs> Remember? That's exactly what it was. Probably for Halloween or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, it was baby Huey. Okay, so Jake was a heroin addict. 
It started out with an injury. He fell um, off a roof and he broke his uh, one of his vertebrae. And he went to the doctors for it. And they, you know, and they started out by giving him opioids. So he got addicted to opioids. But eventually, being that he didn't have insurance, he couldn't afford those anymore. And started working as a, a piercer again. And one of his clients said, here, try these. They'll help you. And it turns out they are heroin pills. I didn't know heroin came in a pill form. Yeah. Wow. He didn't shoot up. For some reason, I thought he was a black tar heroin user. No. Like he smoked it. I don't know why I thought that. I didn't know that, honey. Yeah, it was a pill. Hmm. Okay. He might have been. He might have been shooting up that that day, but I mean, he never shot up in front of me, or I never saw any utensils. I know that he. Was, I've seen the pills. Hmm. Well, McKinnon doesn't drink, nor does he do drugs, and so he was the go-to guy with his friends who'd had addiction issues because he's always been the sober friend. He's always been the one that drives and all that stuff. You know, the hardest thing that McKinnon drinks is diet coke. <laughs> I drink uh, occasionally. My friends go out and they do shots, so I'll, I'll do a shot with them, but I can't tell you the last time I was actually drunk. Probably I can because you called your sister and said, oh, I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and that was about 10 years ago. Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> Jake was an awesome guy, and he was trying to get sober. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason I'm bringing Jake up is because I have a really cool story about Jake. Okay. Um, because, you know, we talk about synchronicity and we talk about coincidences and so on. So, Jake had a dog. And, Rip. Ri well, he named him Ipkis. Ipkis. Yeah, mm. which, and Jake had to move and he brought this big dog over to my house and it was part lab, part pit bull, looking more like a pit bull than it did a lab. And he had not been pretty. fixed. He was very pretty. He had not been fixed. And so he had, had said to me, would you take care of my dog? Well, again, I try not to be an enabler, so I said, well, I'll take care of your dog, but you have to work in my yard. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I said, I'm not taking that dog while it's not been fixed. That dog has to be fixed. He said, well, Mom, because all McKinnon's friends call me Mom. And Mom, I don't have the money to get him fixed. I said, I'll fix him, Jake. I said, I'll fix him, but you got to work in the yard. Okay. So Jake would come over in my yard and be so hot and he's big and he was hairy and tattered and, and pierced. Sweaty. And he'd sweat and he'd sweat and I'd go out with water and he'd go, look what I did over here, Mom. And he was just a giant, funny, darling teddy bear. Correct? Correct. And he relapsed. And when he relapsed, he took the same amount that he once took and it took his life. And his brother had killed himself how many years before? Four. Four years before. And Jake's father called McKinnon, and McKinnon went to the house to call the police to help the father. I got a call at work again. I was at work. And Pops said, McKinnon, Jacob's dead. And I said, ha ha, Pops. Very funny. No, he's dead. He's dead. And, and he just started wailing. And it wasn't Pops, you know, the, to do something like that. So I said, I'm on my way. And I drove a million miles an hour. I remember it was raining. I was afraid I was going to get spun out somewhere. But I'm, I drove a million miles an hour, and I got there just the same time the cops got there. And I ran into the bedroom to see Jacob on the bed, looking like Buddha, <laughs> except his head was his head was down. So that left me with Ipkis, and I called Ipkis Red Dog because I could not go out in my yard and go here, Ipkis. And Red Dog was strong, and instead of me walking Red Dog, Red Dog walked me. And Red I Dog did, loved you. Yes, Red Dog loved me, as do most dogs, and I couldn't handle him. I couldn't handle him, and he I was heavier than than Mom, so he would get he would lay on top of Mom, and Mom couldn't get him off, and so she'd have to yell at one of us to come and get him because <laughs> she couldn't get up. 
basically he would just lay right on top of her. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, my, my husband had just been diagnosed with dementia and I was just, it had all this stuff and my grandchild had been newly born and, you know, goodness gracious, there was a lot. And so I was sitting in my office one day and a, a young boy was seeing me and he, I, he said that after his session with me, he was going to the pound to get a dog. And I said, well, what kind of dog do you want? And he said, oh, I want a big dog. And I said, really? Get in my car. <laughs> so I took him to my house and I opened the door and Red Dog wrapped his arms around this boy just like he used to do Jake. And I knew that that dog and that boy were meant. Well, the moral of my story is the coincidence, the serendipitousness is that Jake's dad's name, Pops, was Bruce. So this boy took Red Dog, and I told him his name had been Ipkiss, and we called him Red Dog, home with him. And a few days later, I called to check and said to him, how is the dog doing? He said, well, I renamed the dog. I said, what did you name him? He said, I named him Bruce. And he had no idea that that was what Jake's father's name was. And interestingly, just about four or five weeks ago, I felt something about that young boy, and I texted his mother to see how he was doing. She said, well, you must have just felt that we had to put Red Dog down. He had cancer, so now Jake has Ipkiss at home in heaven with him. Whether he calls him Ipkiss, Red Dog, or Bruce, we don't know. <laughs> but I was so mad at Jake that as a medium, I said to him, don't you dare come talk to me. I'm not speaking to you, you little brat. And um, his girlfriend... Haley. came to one of my night of readings and Jake has a different first name that I didn't know about what is it Jake's first name is Cameron he went by Jake his middle name and so he blindsided me because I was in this night of readings and all of a sudden I said who knows Cameron <laughs> and so Jake found a way to talk to me after all and talk to his girlfriend who um, has also been struggling a little bit with depression right Oh uh, yeah, she's done a lot. She's kind of followed in my footsteps, unfortunately. Yeah. And recently, well, we don't need to go into any of that stuff. Yeah. yeah she's had some struggles. Some struggles. Anyway, so Jake is still part of, of our lives, I even though he's on the other side. Now, I don't know. I never really knew Morgan. But Jake is certainly still part of our lives. And McKinnon has a picture of Jake. And, you know, we we still connect with Jake. So... Yeah. Right. Jake he greets me every every morning when I wake up. There's this stupid mug on the toilet. <laughs> He's got a picture of him with a big smile, and all you can see is his face. But what you don't know is that he was actually sitting on the, on the toilet. <laughs> that was the kind of humor he 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 was a funny guy. So that was one of McKinnon's McKinnon's blows too. So we we all we are in honor of 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 Jake. What do you need from people, McKinnon, to help you get through depression besides these, the fact that your friends will reach out when they see something on Facebook? What else do you need? Not to exercise stigma. I think people look at you and say, ooh, you're depressed. You know, knock it off. They don't understand that it's not something you can just knock off. They don't understand that it's an actual illness. An actual like disease. one of those pull yourself up by pull your bootstraps. Pull yourself by your bootstraps. You, the, suck it up. Suck it up. Yeah, that was That's a big one. I have a lot of friends that when I first came out and told everyone that I was suffering from depression, I got a lot of suck it ups. You can do it. All you need to do is go outside and enjoy the outdoors. You'll be fine. Like, no, that's not how it works, guys. Sorry. Um, do you suck it up though? Because I think you actually do yeah, suck it up. You, you, you have to. You, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here right now. If if I really wanted to just do what I want to do, I'd stay on my couch and not get up. Certainly not get on a program and talk about it. Right. But this is a form of sucking it up, is it not? Yeah. I mean, this is a real suck up. You know, when we when we when we talked to McKinnon about getting on the show and and doing this, he was like, "Well, okay, but what are we going to talk about?" <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, and how 
how often do you get to talk to somebody that has suffered from depression to the degree where they have had suicidal thoughts and been in the hospital and worked through some things and I think we're just all blessed and lucky that he has sucked it up to the degree of, of being able to talk so as when aside from people saying that you know um, what do you like do you, what do you need just understanding you know understand that sometimes I'm not going to want to talk to you I'm going to look at your phone call and put my phone right back down and not answer it. And <clears throat> it's nice to see someone reaching out or calling you, trying to talk to you. Even though you don't answer it, it's still nice to see those things. Because you know someone's trying to reach out to you. Sometimes it's just hard to take a shower. It's hard to it's hard to get out of bed you know I there's times where Nika needed to go for a walk and Nika's my pride and joy she's my favorite thing in the world my little dog and she she needed to go pee and I would be so depressed that I couldn't get out of bed to take her to go pee and so she would sit there and whine at me until I finally was like fine and get up and do it but things that I need from people are not to look at me like I'm broken either because a lot of times you get those oh you're suffering from a disease you're broken you know and that makes it worse sometimes you know I have a couple girlfriends that were like so so sad about everything and it's just like get off me you know I don't need this kind of behavior all I need is if I come to you and I say listen I feel like I want to die I don't need you to say anything I just need you to rec recognize that be there and be like you want to die or you know have a conversation not freak out not belittle me not tell me to suck it up just have a conversation why why do you want to die what about this what about you know I get a what about your family a guy who's in a place where he wants to die thinks it's you think it's better for the family. Why? You think you're doing them a favor because you're just such a drag. So for to feel like you're ready to go, like you're ready to use, in my case it was a knife, was what I was going to use, a specific knife that I have. It's a big hunting bowie knife. It's really sharp. My doctor has it now, so don't worry about it. But <clears throat> to get to that point where you have it at your throat and you start feeling a trickle of blood coming down from your neck where you're poking yourself, you're at a place where you think you are such a piece of junk that no one's going to care anyway. And even if they do care, it's better off for them to not have you. And I've been, I still sometimes feel that way. I mean, it comes in waves. Sometimes uh, I'll be sitting on my couch watching a basketball game and pops in my head. You should do this. And you got to be like, no, that's BS. And you got to push it away. And then a couple days go by and pops in your head again. But it's not, when you're in a depression where you're in the hospital, it's not that it just pops in your head every once in a while. It's where it's you push it away and it's still there and it's still there and it's still there and it's still there and it won't go away and it's to the point where you're almost listening to it to where you have a plan where you're ready to go you know Nika saved my life because I was so focused on on the act Nika started whining 
at my door. And it woke me up basically out of a fugue that I was in. And it was like, oh, well, who's going to take care of Nika? What happens if they don't find me for a few days? Poor girl's going to not have any food and water. You know, and so then I started thinking about it, thinking about it, and thought my way out of it. But that's when I called Amanda. And I was like, okay, this is bad. And so... At the time, Amanda worked at a SMI hospital, actually. Yeah. So um, Amanda knew exactly what to do. I, I think her and Rick knew what to do. Yeah, I made the right call and calling them. <coughs> it's almost done, sweetheart. You just got 15 minutes. You've made it. This and is hard for him to just do this for 90 minutes. You know that guy is like, this is hard. So... Yeah, that's why he just looked at his watch. She's got a few more minutes, hon. Okay. So, do you, do you feel that there's been times in uh, you know you're a grown man, and when you're a grown man, it's different, uh, you know, than when you're a little boy. But what I've noticed that <clears throat> is in the last six months that is that you've allowed me to be affectionate with you. <laughs> like you know more than like you know we all say we love each other so, but he's laid his head on me or he's let me cut, hug and hug him and or he'll just come sometimes and lay on my couch and fall asleep do you find that that affection is helpful because you know you I think that uh, something I noticed with our family is that there wasn't a lot of affection we just, like you said we say we love you you know but like even with Amanda and Jason as siblings, we don't even give each other a hug when we see each other. And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And so I made a point of starting with one and maybe working with the others because I don't know how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. But they're still there for you emotionally. They try they to are. be, you know. No, if I, I, I know that I could call them at 3 in the morning and they would, maybe Amanda wouldn't answer because she's. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe but she'd go, what? <laughs> Rick, Rick would answer. Rick, would Rick is Amanda's husband, everybody. And Jason would answer if I called him at 3 in the morning. Right. But, so I know I have the support there. That's not... But not that, not that kind of... But I was there's a never very been any affection there. But I was a very affectionate mommy when you were a little boy. Yeah, the way that you are with Elliot. Yes. And that poor kid. I tell you, he's getting so sick of the smooches. <laughs> Well, you got pretty sick of smooches, too, for a yeah, while. Yeah, I bet I did. <laughs> but you're right. As adults, you guys don't hug like, you know. We should. But I noticed that Bill will hug you sometimes when he says hello to you. And he has. He shakes my hand. Does he? I thought you did a man hug a couple times. Do you think that that's been a contributing factor to support? give you some support having a friend that a man that's older yeah I mean it's always nice to have an, another friend that will let you talk to them mm -hmm. and not interrupt you you know that's one thing about conversations that I dislike is when you have one that person's not listening to what you say they're just getting ready to say what they want afterwards you know they're not listening and with depression, you need someone that listens because it's not – it's more cathartic for me to talk to someone and have it bounce back and have them listen than it is for me to listen to someone talk to me about it that doesn't know what's going on. Unless I'm talking to someone who – I Debbie and I probably could have had a whole conversation about it because – we both been there. We both understand how it feels, mm -hmm. and which you know is interesting. Which is why groups work so yeah, well. Yeah, which is interesting because for all that I've been through in my life, I've never suffered from depression. So I probably wouldn't have the same ability to be relatable to you that Debbie does because you know me. I've just always like forge ahead no matter what mm -hmm. and that's my nature so I think maybe that can be difficult too to not have a parent 
I'm your only parent to be relatable. Maybe I've been at fault for being one of the suck it up kind of people because I've always sucked it up. You know, if people Maybe relate from you, you know, you know, people relate to each other from their own experiences a lot, you know? Yeah. I think over the years you've gotten more to because of the your clientele you've learned more about depression and anxiety and so now you're kind of more your skill set is more adept to dealing with someone who's got the problems that I have. You know what I think it is, son? I think that um, when you're dealing with your own family, like I can be great with a client, but in truth when you're dealing with your own family and it triggers your, out, your own emotions out, you're different than you are mm -hmm. with your family. You know, like, because I think in lots of ways people take things personally, even when they know better. Like, mm -hmm. what did I do to fuck this kid up? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, so y y your agenda is different when it's your own kid than it's when it's somebody sitting somebody in the chair, kid. right? And so I think I've had to, you know, we always teach the things we need to learn the most. And I think I've had to learn over time to apply what I was teaching others into my own life. One. And two, I think being a medium and talking to people who have died through suicide has made it much different for me because of the level of talking to so many people, excuse me, suicide survivors here and I would dare say suicide survivors over there because I'm talking to them and they are telling some of the reasons why and how they felt and so on and so forth and talking and trying to communicate that between parent and child, brother and sister, you know, husband and wife. And so I think over the years I've talked to so many suicide survivors that are lost people to suicide and people who have um, chosen to leave the planet that it, it has changed, you know, probably my perspective a great deal, <coughs> which you know, goes back to what I was saying about trying to be unselfish where you were concerned mm -hmm. and not being selfish about wanting my kid, you know, just wanting my kid and doing, you know, doing that, that dance of uh, desperation, you know, which never serves anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. That surrounds suicide. Because it takes a while. You don't just one day just go, you know what, I'm going to kill myself. It takes a while to get to there, and that dance of whoever's around you watching you go down the spiral, I mean, it, the dance is there the whole time. Mm -hmm. So if we were to, you know, put together a list of tools, what I've heard you say tonight is that listening is one of the most effective mm -hmm. tools to help somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, but not just to listen, but to listen without judgment, um, to, you know, um, listen without yes. having the judgment involved, to reach out to somebody when you see that they're having a struggle at that particular reason. And with social media, we get to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing hugs and, hugs and affection is a tool. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm hearing a good therapist. I'm hearing therapist a good doctor. That, that listens to you. That's one thing I like about my therapist is that he waits for you to talk. He asks you a question and he'll wait. And then after you're done speaking, he'll you won't speak right away. He'll wait and then he'll start talking again. So a good therapist, a good doctor, a good support system of friends and family, people who listen without judgment, people who reach out, giving hugs and affection. Mm -hmm. In your own life, for your own tools, do you do you write? Do you draw? Do you journal? I mean, here you we just showed. I was this, drawing this, for a while. Yeah, the talent that you have. Mm -hmm. not, you lose interest. One of the problems with depression is you lose interest with anything that you found fascinating before. I used to read a ton, and I try reading and I cannot for the life of me. Even right now, I can't read because I get distracted or I'm bored. And it's things that I know that I would really, I used to enjoy. 
Same with drawing. I used to draw a lot, and now it's like a chore to pick up a pad of paper and a pen, and you're just like, ah. and then you just want to sleep all the time. And so right now I'm working on not sleeping and trying to find something that I enjoy. Right now I'm taking my dog for walks a lot. Mm -hmm. So we walk all over our complex, and that's good enough right now. Good. Good. We have a phone call. Jane. Jane. <laughs> Got it? Hi, Jane. Hi there. So I think I'm a few minutes behind. You may have covered it if I were to advance, but I wanted to, you know, see everything. I'm just wondering, McKinnon. Yeah. And again, thank you so much. No is there something as a a parent would be able to notice or anything for a younger, uh, maybe late teenager, early 20 -ish. Definitely. And that was something that I was just talk we were just talking about was lack of liking something that you, they used to enjoy. Like if you're, if you're 20 something year old, used to really enjoy drawing or reading or riding bikes or something like that and all of a sudden just doesn't like to do any of that stuff anymore becomes lethargic kind of stays in their bedroom doesn't do anything sleeps a lot I think sleeping a lot is a big deal those are those are definitely those are some things that if you have depression that you should be on a lookout for Weight gain, weight loss. Yeah, weight gain, weight loss. You know, being just not wanting to do anything. You know, like take a shower in the morning. A a outbursts of anger for no reason. I remember that McKenna and I were sitting in a restaurant. It was we got there first, waiting for the rest of the family. Um, and McKenna had a, an angry outburst at a waitress. Got up, ran out of the restaurant. You know. Uh, came back to me a few minutes later um, started to cry I'm really sorry I didn't mean that I'm an ass and I'm like you're not it's okay it's okay don't worry about it don't let it make the day bad and we kind of fixed it because he actually came back to fix it but things like that right McKenna yeah no control over emotions just crying just for no reason I know that I was like a little girl and I would cry just thinking about things um, watching commercials would make me cry it was anyone anyway, it sounds funny no but, it doesn't because you stuffed a lot of emotion for a long time but I had right. a lot so if you take that back then uh, you know like back in years or time so let's just say right at that point you could notice something is going on with another person yeah what if you bring it back? Like, what if it's not as noticeable as something like that? How does a parent or, and again, going to a younger age, how do you know that that's depression as opposed to, you know, 50 million other things like, you know, that age or whatever? You, you don't always know, but Jane. How would you be able to help that? You don't always know, Jane. I've talked to parents who've had young children, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, who've had um, absolutely um, done something uh, without thought. Um, you know, uh, people who have um, impulse control issues, okay? So there, there are times that I've talked to parents that there was an impulse control issue, but there are certain groups of people, too, that have a more predisposed situation to depression and one of the other guests that I think would be great for you guys to listen to would be my daughter because she actually is the expert on some of this and um, has worked at a six you know in uh, SMI for a couple of years and will be able to address some of that but you know there are people who with the you know, impulsively take their lives. Um, there are um, certain groups. The LBGTQ community, for example, has a higher rate of suicide. Um, people with uh, certain uh, mental illnesses, as far as 
um, bipolar um, could, you know, would are more at a, a, a risk factor. People who've had suicide in their family are more at a risk factor. So, you know, we'll definitely try to find all those answers out for you. Um, you know, military personnel are more likely to have suicide um, ideation or thoughts and so on. So, you know, they're, they're go ahead. Honey. I was just going to say, and if you think there's something wrong to the point where you're seriously questioning what's going on, take them to the doctor. Have the doctor talk to them. To a counsel mm -hmm. and to a counselor. Yeah, to a counselor. Have some therapy. Everyone needs therapy. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. Therapists will tell you that everyone needs therapy. And good ther <laughs> and, and good, good therapists. and good therapists go get therapy because I can't tell you, you know, the therapy that I've had actually um, because it it all kind of trickles down through generations. So. Jane, we appreciate your calling, and uh, thank you. We appreciate. And everything. I can't believe how fast this time went. It just was so wonderful to hear all of this information. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Have a nice night. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good night. So, I want to. I, you know, in closing, want to thank you for doing this for everybody. Yeah. Um, I know it wasn't easy for you. I didn't and, cry too uh, much. You did great, and I didn't fall apart. No. <laughs> we did okay. Yeah, we, we did we, all right. We thought about falling apart. Trust us. We were like, what if we fall apart? But yeah, we did okay. Yep. And I do think your sister would be a good person I to, think she, to yeah, help with Jason this. Jason would be good. I yeah. think that Amanda would be good. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. We, You know, we have a family. What is that? You know, a family full of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the other the other kids both have different areas of expertise, and and McKinnon's going back to work. His area of expertise is also in the medical industry and in the healing arts, by the way. And he's always risen to the top in every job that he's ever had. And we we are going to ask you all to hold really good thoughts and space for him and his new job. And thank you again, as always, for joining us. Next week we will have readings. So um, thank you for joining us. Good night. Good night, everybody.